Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to True Crime Cases. I'm your host, Lainey. It's something we usually only hear about in old stories by Charles Dickens, a young child raised in poverty, striving to make something of themselves and breaking into the world of the 1% through sheer luck. You know, rags to riches stories. But rarely ever does this come to pass because of the child's hard work. Usually it's because they turn out to be secretly related to a wealthy merchant or find some great treasure, or are left a fortune by a distant relative or strange old woman. But sometimes, these stories can come to pass in the real world. Flor de Lis dos Santos de Salsa could be considered one of Brazil's most famous rags-to-riches stories. Flor de Lis was surrounded by poverty, violence, and despair, but she knew that there was a beautiful world at her fingertips. She became determined at a young age and remained steadfast throughout her youth to achieve the higher goals she had set for herself, from fostering children to singing and politics. All goals to make the world a better place for as many people as possible. Incredibly, Flora de Lis rose from the ashes of her small crime-ridden neighborhood and settled into a home in a gated community in a prominent section of Rio de Janeiro. Moreover, Flor de Lis stayed true to herself and used her charitable nature to share her good fortune with others, some calling her the Mother Teresa of Brazil, thanks to all the kind deeds she carried out. But as always seems to be the way, not all things continued on an uptrend in Flor de Lis's life, and everything was not as it appeared. After 24 years of marriage, Flor de Lis began to believe that her husband, who fully supported her in all areas of her success, was preventing her from reaching her dreams. With this belief, Flora de Lis concocted a plan to ensure no one would stand in her way of success and notoriety. Okay, on to the show. Flor de Lis was born on February 5, 1961, in Jacarezino, Rio de Janeiro, to parents Francisco dos Santos and Carmozine Moita dos Santos. Flor de Lis also had siblings, but more information about them and their lives as children is needed. Jacarezino is a favela, or neighborhood in Rio de Janeiro, with a population of 39,000 residents, living within 232 square miles of the sprawling city. In comparison, the United States city of Chicago, Illinois, is 227.10 square miles, with a population of 2.665 million residents. Jacarezino is sparsely populated compared to what we might expect from a city. Yet Jacarezino and many other favelas are still fraught with problems that tend to come hand-in-hand poverty, violence, and a prominent drug presence. Despite the criminal atmosphere of Jaca Rezino, Flora de Lis and her family were among the vast communities living in the area that were deeply religious. The family was active in their evangelical church, and Flora de Lis began to step into the role of pastor at a young age. She did this first by becoming part of the church choir, and then, as she gained confidence, she would even conduct prayer groups for community members. The Dos Santos home was always open to anyone who needed help, as it was only the right thing to do according to their beliefs. Because of this, many of the neighborhood children would be left at Flora de Lis's home for her mother to babysit them while their parents worked in any way they could. In no time, the family home resembled a daycare center, and the poor quality of life Flora de Lis witnessed in those around her strengthened her devotion to helping those in need, especially children. When Flor de Lis was just 14 years old in 1975, her family received the tragic news that her father and brother had been killed in a car accident. This traumatic event understandably rocked the family to its core, emotionally and financially. To help make ends meet after her father's death, Flor de Lis started working as a clerk in a bakery at the age of 15. 
Once Flora Delis reached adulthood in the 1980s, she began working as an elementary school teacher and being a full-fledged pastor of her evangelical church after years of work at the altar. She became the mother of three biological children, her first son Flavio with one partner. After they separated, she met another man, with whom she had Simone and Adriano. Becoming a mother sparked something inside of her, and even though neither of the fathers stayed in their children's lives, Flora de Lis was determined to make something of this newfound determination. She felt she had more love to share with other children and could offer a better future than most due to where she had climbed the rag to riches ladder. So, in 1991, she adopted five more children. Among these five adopted children would be her future husband, Anderson Ducarmo. Yep. You heard that right, but that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. On July 23, 1993, Flora de Lis, her children, and their community were faced with a horrific event. What is now known as the Candelaria Massacre took place in front of Rio's historic Roman Catholic Church, the Candelaria Church. The grounds inside of the Candelaria Church housed hundreds of unsheltered children. This was, believe it or not, one of the safest places for them to be, as workers at the church were kind enough to feed the children and provide them with education and religious advice whenever possible. Many of the children living in this situation were tangled up in Rio's illegal drug dealings and sex work, out of sheer necessity and desperation to survive. Police usually monitored the area around the church, not for the sake of the children, however, but due to the increasingly frequent criminal acts being carried out by the children, including pickpocketing and robbery. The morning before the massacre took place, witnesses reported that a group of children had been throwing rocks at passing police vehicles. This wasn't an uncommon interaction between the two groups, and since the children were usually just given a verbal warning for minor infractions such as this, nobody thought much further about the situation. Then, just after midnight on July 23, 1993, multiple Chevrolet Chevettes with hidden license plates stopped in front of the church. The passengers in the vehicles got out and brandished weapons, firing shots at the nearly 70 children who were sleeping near the church's grounds. In total, eight unhoused individuals, including six minors, lost their lives as a result of the mass shooting. Several other individuals suffered non life threatening injuries but even mild injuries can become life-threatening to those living unhoused and in poverty. At the conclusion of the investigation into the massacre, it was revealed that several of the men who shot at the children were members of the police force, an apparent retaliation of the children throwing rocks at their patrol cars. The tragedy of the massacre did not end with the events of that July night, however. An additional 39 surviving youths from the massacre eventually fell into harm's way. Many of the children grew to become street criminals, landing themselves in jail or at the mercy of street gangs. Some of the children ended up in mental facilities for treatment of various mental disorders and drug addiction. A few were killed by local drug gang members, and it is believed that was done to silence the children so they could not testify as witnesses against the police at their trial. The three policemen responsible for the massacre were tried, but only two of the men were convicted of the crime. This event sent shock ripples throughout the community, and only further encouraged Flor de Lis to take in those around her who were in need of aid. In 1994, Flor de Lis adopted 37 children, including 14 infants, and most of these children were unhoused youth who had survived the Candelaria massacre. Flora de Lis welcomed the children into her home and provided clothing, food, shelter, and love to these troubled youth. The children that Flora de Lis adopted have various backstories, and I'll go over just a few of them to give you an idea of what the children in the favela were living with. Rayan was a child who was found in a trash can when she was only 15 days old. Carlos is now a pastor and has come incredibly far since he was a drug dealer when he was initially adopted by Flor de Lis. Kelly worked as a sex worker before Flor de Lis invited her into her home and was quoted as saying, My mother is great. She has a big heart. There's no mother like her in Brazil, in the Americas. Lucas was beaten by his biological parents, 
the trauma of which caused him to become deaf and mute. He was not safe with his blood family, but he was with Fleur de Lis. The day after they were born, twin sisters Annabelle and Isabel were given up by their mother, who intentionally gave them to Fleur de Lis. This last example in particular might give you an idea of how Fleur de Lis was viewed by her community, a kind, caring woman who looked after all the children she could. Flora de Lis was able to give these children love, which is something that they had hardly ever experienced before they met her. She was also able to feed them and provide clothing for them while living in a stable environment, which was all too common a luxury in their favela. Throughout this time, Flora de Lis believed that she had found her soulmate and finally married him in 1998. However, as we mentioned earlier, this wasn't your usual courting and dating situation. Anderson de Carmo was one of the four children Flor de Lis adopted in 1991. Although he originally had a stable home environment with his loving biological parents, Anderson frequented Flor de Lis's home often and ultimately decided to leave his parents to join the blended family. Upon entering the family at 14 years old, Anderson began having a sexual relationship with Flor de Lis's biological daughter, Simone, who was just 15 at the time. Flora de Lis seemed to be in favor of this relationship, as this meant that the two teenagers spent most of their time at home. This relationship eventually ended, at which point Anderson began a relationship with Flora de Lis, who was 16 years older than him at the age of 30. Neither of these relationships were in any way appropriate in my opinion, which probably won't surprise you to hear. When Anderson was 21, the two married and then continued to care for their growing family of adopted children. In one discomforting move, he went from being their adopted sibling to their father. Under Flor de Lisa's direction, Anderson also became a pastor, and the duo co-founded the church Comunidade Evangelica Ministerio Flor de Lis in 1999. The church soon grew into an evangelical empire, building to the point where its ranks included nine churches. The largest church in the empire was a converted bus depot that held 5,000 worshippers. The building also contained a shuttered nursery, an administrative office, and a cafe. Near the building's entrance, there was even a gift shop that sold Flor de Lisa CDs and DVDs. The couple would adopt 10 more children into their family over the next 15 years of marriage. The majority of these children were from similar situations to their adopted siblings, neglected by their parents and found in violent areas of Rio de Janeiro. Flor de Lis and Anderson went on to have a total of almost 55 children in their family, with roughly 52 being adopted in addition to Flor de Lis's three biological children. I say almost because it really isn't clear just how many children they took in. During her time adopting children, Flora de Lis was often threatened by local gangsters who were enraged that Flora de Lis was caring for the children who their gangs would normally prey upon for trafficking or recruitment into the gangs. These included threats on her life, but Flora de Lis was not deterred, and none of them followed through with the acts of violence promised. Flor de Lis was also not deterred by any troubled child, no matter how distressing the situation. It is reported that she would approach a child in the street who was holding a gun, and Flor de Lis remarked, I would tell him, put down your gun, I want to be your mother. Of course, it wasn't easy having a family of nearly 60 people, the majority of whom had been raised in neglect, violence, and crime. Flor de Lis stated, with some of my children, we had months and months of fights, about drugs, for example. I teach them, if you want respect, you should make people respect you. And it wasn't cheap either. It takes 6 kilos, 13.2 pounds of rice, and 200 loaves of bread each day to feed those in Flor de Lisa's house. And that only accounts for food. Never mind clothing and toiletries and other living necessities. Flor de Lis and Anderson had to hold Baptist masses to earn money to provide for the children's living and education expenses. Not everyone thought that Flor de Lis was doing a good deed by caring for so many children. In one particular case, a biological parent sued Flor de Lis for custody of their biological child and won, getting their child back. 
Flor de Lis later spoke about the situation, stating, I found a child named B in a hospital with broken legs. His father had twisted them. Doctors said the boy would never walk again, but I made him undergo treatment and he began to walk. His father obtained court permission to get him back. I gave the child away and ten days later, he was killed by his father. After this, Flor de Lis vowed to never give any of her children away and to always have an open-door policy to accept new children into her household. The children reported that sometimes Flor de Lis was strict with them, but they understood that there were so many children to care for, it was incredibly difficult to run the place otherwise. Flor de Lis agreed with being strict and stated, Like any mother, I may be tough with my children or punish them, but I'll never allow anybody else to speak badly of them. The way of life they had and the way their biological parents treated them, they could have become the worst people in the world, but they haven't. They're better than many other children who grew up in full families. Flor de Lis stated that her ultimate goal for her children was that they one day have a house of their own. Once that time arrived, she believed that her mission to save children would end. In 2004, Flor de Lis decided to try her luck in politics, running as a candidate in the election for the San Gonzalo City Council. Though this bid was unsuccessful, Flor de Lis didn't let this stop her. She remained steadfast and continued to evangelize with her husband Anderson and their church. Flor de Lis was also a talented singer and independently released gospel albums. After she took in multiple children following the massacre, Flor de Lis began to gain attention from the Brazilian media. Filmmakers approached Flor de Lis about producing a film based on her life and her adoptive children. Popular Brazilian actors were cast to star in the film, and these actors opted to be in the film at no cost. Again, showing just how highly people thought of Flor de Lis throughout Brazil. In following with Flor de Lis's charitable nature, any profits made by the film titled Flor de Lis Bastem Polvalara para Mudar, which translates roughly, because forgive my Portuguese, to Flor de Lis, just a word for change, were donated to a rehabilitation center for children. Flor de Lis continued to produce gospel albums, as singing was one of her passions. In 2010, shortly after the release of the film, Flor de Lis approached the Rio de Janeiro gospel music label MK Music. She was seeking a record deal, and the recent media attention for her film guaranteed her one. She released her first album with MK Music in 2010, titled Fugo e Uso, Fire and Anointing. Flor de Lis went on to release five more albums with the label and sold out multiple concert venues to fans who referred to her simply as Flor de Lis. Early in her musical career with MK Music, Flor de Lis attempted to break into politics once more. She was a member of the Brazilian Democratic Movement, or the MDB Party, between 2004 and 2018, and in 2016, she ran for mayor of Sugosalo as a representative of the MDB Party. She was also not successful in this election and yet again shifted her attention back to her gospel singing to continue to make a name for herself. As her fame and notoriety as a gospel singer grew, coupled with her charitable persona of being an adoptive mother to many, Flor de Lis was finally able to enter the political arena. In 2018, she won the race for a seat at Brazil's Chamber of Deputies, which is similar to the American Congress. According to The Guardian, Flor de Lis became one of Rio's most favored federal lawmakers, receiving almost 200,000 votes from the public. Flor de Lis promised the community in her inaugural speech, I'm going to fight for family, for life, and for women. Anderson, who managed her political career, was very proud of his wife. He said to a camera at an airport as the couple waited to fly to the capital, I want to thank all of you who had faith and gave Flor a place in this movement to change Brazil. Isn't that right, love? Flor de Lis and her family personified a picture of a happy, cohesive unit. But her fans and constituents were not aware of the trouble that was brewing behind the closed doors in the home of Brazil's power couple, Anderson and Flor de Lis.
although she claimed the children in her care to be her own, she did not treat them all equally. This caused a divide between the adopted children and the family. Flora de Lis showed a great favoritism to her three biological children and the initial five children that she adopted, which included Anderson. She referred to these eight children as the first generation, and they had the luxury of having their own rooms, as well as being able to enjoy delicious meals with Flor de Lis. The remaining adopted children were forced to share rooms with multiple children occupying the same space. These children were not fed as well as the first generation and were given plain bread with no butter, plain rice or pasta with minimal sauce to eat. There were also accusations of mental, physical, and sexual abuse of the adopted children. One adopted child disclosed in a deposition that he had been initiated into the family after he attended a prayer group at Florida de Lisa's and Anderson's church. This 17-year-old reported that he was commanded to participate in a purification ritual once the family came home from the prayer group. This ritual forced the child to be alone in a room for a week, after which Flora de Lis joined him and the two engaged in sexual activity. In retrospect, this child claimed that the house dynamics were more of a cult than a family. Many of the adopted children claimed that they too had been subjected to secret rituals, which allegedly involved blood, nudity, and sex. One child in the house reported that Flora de Lis had once forced the children to cut their hands to draw blood, then instructed them to write psalms from the Bible in their blood on the walls of their room. Some children claimed that they saw black magic being performed by Flora de Lis. According to reports from UOL News, Flora de Lis and Anderson both had sexual relationships with some of their older adopted children, who were presented as a motivation to gain donations for their ministry. Disgustingly, it was also reported that Flora de Lis and Anderson would often offer the older female adoptees to other pastors as a sexual gift. The majority of the children were deprived of basic needs and educational resources. Flora de Lis seemed to only be focused on her public image as being a devout Christian, gospel singer, and political figure. She didn't really care about the actual situation of her children. Anderson, however, began to realize that some of the children were being neglected and attempted to change this by creating a more balanced relationship within the entire family. He accused her of giving preferential treatment to some of the children. Flora de Lis did not like that at all. She resented that Anderson had involved himself in the structure of the family hierarchy and did not appreciate that Anderson also managed the family's finances and accounts along with her own political career. As her political career excelled, Flora de Lis no longer wanted Anderson to be a part of her career or her life. She then, naturally, began plotting to murder her husband. Beginning in May of 2018, Flora de Lis, along with her children Flavio, Simone, Lucas, and Marzi, started to poison Anderson's food and drinks with incremental doses of arsenic and cyanide. Simone, Flora de Lis's biological daughter, searched on the internet for cyanide in food and was ultimately questioned about this search by investigators. The poison-laced food and beverages began to make Anderson very sick. He presented to the local hospital multiple times with symptoms of diarrhea, vomiting, and profuse sweating. In total, Flora de Lis had attempted to end Anderson's life by poisoning a total of six times, but none were successful. On the heels of the failed poisoning attempts, Flora de Lis and the children she had roped into helping her considered hiring a hitman to kill Anderson. The event was to appear as a robbery attempt gone wrong, although this plan was never acted upon. Internet searches for possible hitmen were found on one of the adopted children's devices. Then, in the early morning of June 16, 2019, Flora de Lis was able to play the role of a grieving wife when Anderson was shot 30 times in the thighs and groin in the garage of the couple's home. He died at the scene at only 41 years old. Flora de Lis told a reporter with The Guardian that on the evening before Anderson's death, the two had shared a romantic stroll down Rio's Copacabana Beach. She claimed that the couple had pulled off to the side of the road to make love on the hood of their car on their way back from the inner city. 
Flor de Lis stated that the two arrived home at about 3 a.m. and she went inside to go upstairs. She claimed that she left Anderson in the garage alone, looking at his cell phone, and only moments later, he was shot. Two of their sons drove Anderson to the hospital, where he was pronounced dead. As Flor de Lis spoke to reporters later that day, she claimed that Anderson had been a victim of a robbery gone wrong and had died defending their family. But this was a story that soon began to crumble. Police organized a raid on Flora de Lis's home a couple of days after Anderson was killed. The search was named Operation Luke 12, giving reference to the New Testament chapter of the Bible in which Jesus tells his disciples, There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. During the search operation on June 18, 2019, investigators located the gun used to murder Anderson. It was found on top of a dresser in the room of Flor de Lis's 38-year-old biological son, Flavio. Two days later, on June 20, 2019, Flavio confessed to investigators that he had been the gunman who fired the multiple fatal shots at his stepfather. Flavio also accused one of his adopted brothers, 18-year-old Lucas Cesar, of helping to purchase the murder weapon. According to prosecutor, Sergio Luis Lopez Pireria, one of the children, stated that the motive for the murder was that Flor de Lis wanted out of the marriage, but could not divorce Anderson because it would violate the name of God. But the police could not arrest Flor de Lis due to her position as an elected official, which gave her parliamentary immunity. Investigators pushed for her status as a member of Congress to be stripped so that charges could be pressed. Flor de Lis was instead ordered to wear an ankle monitor that restricted her movements. She concealed this monitor with long dresses while in the public eye. The next month, in late July 2020, Flora de Lis posted a picture on her Instagram account to her more than one million followers. The picture was of Flora de Lis on a camel with Anderson on a recent trip to Israel. She added the caption, I still feel lost. Part of me died with you. I feel a mixture of pain and disgust. What they did to you was so cruel. I love you, my baby. Flora de Lis pleaded her innocence through her attorney, stating that she never ordered this savage crime to murder her husband. Brazilian authorities felt differently, and police commissioner Alan Duarte told the Brazilian TV network Global that Flor de Lis was the ringleader of the murder plot and the head of an intra-family criminal organization. He stated, The investigation demonstrated that Ms. de Sousa's image of altruism and decency was merely a ploy to gain wealth and political power. In June 2021, the Ethics Council of Brazil approved the loss of the mandate of Representative Flor de Lis by 16 to 1 votes. Lawmakers concluded that her conduct was incompatible with parliamentary decorum. Then, on August 11, 2021, Flor de Lis officially had her mandate as a congresswoman revoked by the chamber in a lawsuit filed by Representative Alexandre Lite. This revocation now meant that she could be charged with her husband's death. Flora de Lis was arrested for the murder of her husband, Anderson, on August 13, 2021. She was charged with a total of five crimes, including triple qualified homicide, criminal association, ideological falsehood, use of a false document, and attempted murder for the previous attempts to poison Anderson in 2018. At the time of her arrest, Flora de Lis recorded a video in which she said, The day has come that nobody wants to come. They are arresting me for something I did not do, for something I did not practice. I do not know why, but they are taking me by force. I expect your strength. Pray for me. Commissioner Duarte commented on Flor de Lis's actions. She's cold. She's calculating. She's sly. I consider Flor de Lis a psychopath. I will only be fully satisfied when she is convicted, jailed, and pays for the crime she committed. On August 17, 2021, charges were announced against a total of nine individuals involved in Anderson's barbaric death. Along with Flavio and Lucas, five other biological and adopted children were charged, Adriano, Carlos, Andre, Marzi, and Simone. Charges were also filed against a man named Marcos for his involvement. 
It isn't clear what the results were of any of these charges, as the only information we found only pertained to Flor de Lis herself. On November 13, 2022, Flor de Lis dos Santos de Sousa was found guilty of ordering the murder of her husband. She was sentenced to 50 years plus 28 days in prison. She is serving her time at Jose Federico Marquez Public Jail in Rio de Janeiro. Since their adopted mother's imprisonment, several of Flora de Lisa's adopted children have left the home that they all shared. These children, mostly now adults, have severed ties with Flora de Lisa and are also not in contact with her biological children. Flora de Lisa's fans and followers remain in disbelief that someone they idolized as a charitable evangelist and singer could be responsible for such heinous acts. And I completely understand this reaction, too. It's almost unthinkable that someone could do so well for themselves, managing to escape extreme poverty by their own hard work and dedication, and portraying themselves as pious and kind, and then turn around and murder their own husband. It just goes to show that greed and pride can corrupt even the most promising of people. This episode was researched and written by Rachel Spillers. She can be contacted at rachelspillersresearch at gmail.com and is a proud graduate of the True Crime Podcast Training Program. Editing and production assistance by Jesse Hawk of the Inky Paw Print. Audio engineering produced by the best in the business, Neeks at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or at the Inky Paw Print.com. <laughs>